Hi everyone, and thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, I'd like to begin by sharing something that another attendee told me yesterday, something that took me by surprise a bit. That the machine learning landscape, landscape is becoming like an Italian ice cream shop. And puzzled asked what that meant, and the answer condensed was, well, so many options, all of them good or really good, and it's so hard to choose these days. And I think there is some truth in that, because compared to, say, five years ago, we do have more technology choices, and I'm, I'll be covering some of them today. Uh, just in case no, uh, anyone is not aware of this, unlike the other presentations in this hall, this is on the applied AI track, so you've been warned, there will be code as well. I'm Razvan, I work in capital markets, we have a lot of data there, there is a lot of money at stake as well, and part of my role is to ensure that the solutions that our team develops scale. So what do you do if a laptop is not enough? Well, at the other extreme of the spectrum, if you're into very heavy deep learning, you kind of already know. It will be TensorFlow in the cloud on as many GPUs or TPUs you have budget for. If you have to process hundreds of terabytes of data, that's likely going to be Spark. However, not, deep learning is not the solution to every machine learning problem, and nor do all companies really have enough data to justify Spark. And you can also use managed cloud services, and yes, they do scale. However, that requires you to go with a particular provider, and choosing one is a much bigger question than just scaling, training a model. So instead of going that route, what I'll do is I'm going to cover three open source frameworks which you can use in any environment, including on-prem. And to paraphrase Dostoevsky, the novelist, all scalable projects are alike, but each unscalable project is unscalable in its own way. Where we need to scale and therefore what technical solution we choose will depend on the problem. For instance, in algo trading or fraud detection, we typically train once in a while, but we need very fast predictions. The bottlenecks that most data scientists run into generally happen in the middle two boxes on the screen, where also the fun is in data science. And prior to that, many of us run into bottlenecks in the previous stage, which no one likes, but everyone has to do, data cleaning and transformation. And can I have a quick show of hands, please? Who here uses Python as the primary language for data science. Okay, I think most of you. Anyone who's been in this very room last weekend for PyCon? Okay, no. That's the, the annual Python conference. Um, you see, time flies. Python's author announced his retirement a few weeks ago, and Python itself will be 30 next year. And at the time it was designed, and the same thing happened with the libraries that came afterwards. No one envisioned the amount of data science and the intensive computation that we ask from it today. And I'll have the links at the end of the presentation if you're curious to understand why. And it's the same story really with R. Like both have fantastic communities, but both of them as themselves, they struggle to process the amount of data that we have today. So, I'll be covering a few options how to do that without abandoning your preferred language. And some things are free in life, but scalability is not one of them. Scaling out by definition means using distributed systems, and they bring complexity and latency. So my first piece of advice would be to actually avoid that by beginning to scale up a single machine. Get the most powerful that you can. And this is a lot easier these days, because with not more than a few bucks per hour, you can get in the cloud a machine with terabytes of RAM and hundreds of cores. This can easily replace what used to be done, say, in Hadoop 10 years ago. And if you need even more intensive computation, the next thing would be to actually add more GPUs in the same single machine. Because the latency in one box is orders of magnitude lower than anything that you can get on the network. And you can get as many as 16 GPUs in one NVIDIA box these days. Now, this is not always applicable. Not ev everything can be solved with GPUs. So then you do need to go distributed in a cluster. And I added a note to remember to add, to scale monitoring as well. That's often forgotten. 
And this is important because distributed systems are very complex, they are difficult to debug, and unless you have visibility into what's happening, it's very difficult to investigate problems or even tune those systems. And there's one more thing we should try before we even get there. The quote is from a great movie about the last financial crisis, um, one that actually got me interested in risk management. And for the purpose of today's talk, either being smart or cheating, I mean, you pick which one, is to try to bypass this need to scale altogether by reducing the data. And the simplest way you can do that is by sampling it. And this is an approach we are actually very comfortable with in real life, because when you go to a medical lab to get your blood work done, fortunately, they don't draw all the blood out in the name of accuracy. And for some business problems, it's perfectly OK to lose a bit of accuracy in the name of a faster response and cheaper cost. Not everything in life is a cattle competition. However, sometimes we cannot do that or we don't want. You know, for instance, in finance, we do want to squeeze everything that's possible from the infrastructure. So in that case, we do need to scale by adding memory or computation power. And if you try to add only one of them, you'll find that in practice, they tend to grow together. As an example, this is the offering from Amazon because they have many options. You can see that as the, the amount of memory grows up into the terabytes, the largest one is 24, so does the number of cores. It ends up being in the hundreds, which means that even if you started by just requiring memory, what you get is a significant amount of parallel computation power. And just by having it in the machines doesn't mean it's going to be used. If you do nothing, most algorithms will still use one core. So we have to do some work as well, and we have to understand what we do. So in, in other words, the foundation of scaling is actually learning first how to saturate the parallel computation power in a single machine. So we'll start with that. And as a very quick refresher about parallelism in Python, uh, CPython, which is the interpreter that most of us use, has, for historical reason, a limitation that today is rather annoying. It only allows one Python thread to run at a time, with the exception of I.O. And this is enforced through a global interpreter lock shown in yellow on screen. Native code, such as in library like NumPy, does not have this limitation. So they can use as many threads as needed. However, if you need to process strings, JSON, anything that we, today we do in Python, that will require you to use multiple processes, because each of them then will have their own gil. Now, whether threads or processes, fortunately, we don't have to go down to that level to manage and to get parallelism in Python. There's a package that will do it for us. It's called joblib. And the only thing that it requires is for us to tell it how we want parallelization to be done. And that joblib is used behind the scenes by many libraries, such as scikit-learn. So if you, have, if you know that you have numerical computation to run, then you should be using threads. This is the most efficient option because all the threads live in the same process and therefore will have access to the shared memory of the process. So you only have one copy of the data in memory. If you need to use multiple processes, you have a few choices. But now each of them will get a copy of the data, so memory usage will go up. Loki is the most recent, uh, the, the more recent backend for Joblib. It's more CPU robust and more, CPU, uh, and more uh, efficient. Multiprocessing is older. Uh, it does crash on some platforms, so it's less recommended, even, the, even though it uses forking and uses less memory. And there's a third option, which I think is better, which I'm going to cover soon. So let's see what, what this means in practice. So this was a bit theoretical. So for pandas, for data processing, unfortunately, we don't have a built-in mechanism to parallelize code. But there is a workaround. If you know that you're going to process numbers, you can actually compile your code with Numba. It's a just-in-time compiler. So what Numba will do for you are two things. First, in most cases, it will speed up the code because it's going to be compiled. And secondly, it will attempt to parallelize it by detecting sections that can, such as loops. 
And for things that it cannot parallelize to make them more efficient, by default, it will execute them with the same speed as Python. If you don't want that to happen, you pass the no Python argument. So it will give you an error. So you will know that it's not going to help. And the fragment in blue on screen is a decorator that you need to put on the functions that you want to parallelize. Scikit-learn is better. Many estimators have been written to use Jobly behind the scenes, if told to. And the way you do that is by passing the number of cores you want to use in the end jobs argument, which is further passed behind the scenes to Jobly. And in most cases, minus one means use all the cores that are available. However, some estimators like XGBoost require the actual number of cores to use. So if you leave minus one, it's still going to use a single one, which is not what you want. And you may say, OK, fine. Now I can do multi-threading. I'm fine. And it's not as simple, because many algorithms cannot be fully parallel all the time. And what you see on the screen on the right is uh, a chart with a CPU usage of XGBoost running on a 12-core system. And as you can see, all the cores are used, but not all the time. And the average across the entire training was actually less than 50%. And the reason this happens is that the serial parts in the algorithm limit when and how much the extra cores can help. And here's a quick example to show that. This is an experiment I did on Amazon, training the same data set of 2 million rows with three classifiers on a machine with 72 cores, one of the compute-optimized in instances. And I, I did the same thing with multiple cores, starting with one. And as expected, a single core was the slowest. And then as I did cores, the training time went down. However, only up to a point at which performance leveled off and even got worse with the addition of extra cores. And the, the theoretical limits of parallelism have been worked out. Amdahl's law, which you, if you Google it, you'll find the formula. They have been worked out. But in practice, we don't use that formula that much. Because it's much harder to quantify how much a particular architecture will slow down, because there are many factors that influence that, which I'll show in a moment. The key takeaway is that you need to measure how much you need to measure when adding cores stops to be useful. And this is similar to what happens in real life with projects, when just adding people to a project doesn't help with the delivery speed. And if you have more cores than the ideal sweet spot, then you have two choices. You can, um, you can use a, a cheaper machine with fewer cores if using the cloud. Or you can decide what else you can do with the extra cores that are available. And here's the, uh, the reason why you shouldn't use that theory too much. Because in practice, besides the algorithm, there are many, many factors that influence the performance in a given system. And many of them have to do with the architecture of the system, down to the cache size, and so on, as well as the entire environment. So it's much simpler and easier instead just to measure how well the system performs. And if you build production systems, well, you need to build telemetry and monitoring anyway. So let's assume, we, OK, we saturated the machine, and we do need to go in a cluster. Um, Spark is more complicated, so I'm going to talk about two other frameworks that are simpler to use and closer if you want to data science. One of them is Dask. It's written in Python. It's pure Python. H2O, which is actually one of the sponsors here, is written in Java and serves a number of languages. Both of them can scale to hundreds of machines, which I hope is enough for most cases. And if you couple, with, if you couple them with Kubernetes, you get adaptive scaling as well. So I'll start with Dask, which is actually part of Anaconda. So if you use it, you already have it installed. And here's an example how you can parallelize first pandas with Dask. So the last two lines look like pandas, but they aren't. Dask has its own data frame API, one that closely follows pandas, so you'll be at home. 
However, what happens behind the scenes is that a pandas data, uh, sorry, a Dask data frame can be larger than RAM and is split transparently into multiple pandas data frames by the index. And these data frames can be spread across a cluster. And there are two new things in this code. First is the line to instantiate a client. This is how you can create a cluster, or you can connect one if you specify a host name. And each worker in a Dask cluster is a different Python process, which means there are no GIL issues, and you can run many of them on the same machine as well. And the second new thing is the call to compute. If you happen to be familiar with Spark, Dask has a similar architecture. Computation is lazy, which means all the transformations, all the steps are only triggered and executed at the very last step. And the reason for this is that Dask behind the scenes is a task scheduler at a lower level. Its job is to keep track of what needs to be done, what are the dependency between, dependencies between tasks, uh, and where the data is, you know, if anything needs to be moved from one node of the cluster to the other. And you have a nice interactive UI as well with which you can follow the progress. And actually, that screenshot is from the same code that you see on the screen. You can also parallelize scikit-learn with Dask. And the way this works is that Dask registers itself as a job lib backend. So now scikit-learn will delegate parallelization to Dask without even being aware that work is being done on multiple machines. And you can, in fact, use the same pattern even on a single machine. What you get extra compared to, say, Loki or multiprocessing, and this is why Earlier, I said there is a third option, which is better, is you'll see, you get a much better visualization UI, which you'll see in a few slides, which allows you to monitor what's happening and how well parallelism works. You can also use DAS to parallelize predictions in a cluster, but they are less interesting to talk about, so I'm only going to point you in the right direction, and you can follow the documentation. I warned you there are a few slides with code. So we are kind of in the middle. If data is larger than RAM, we have a few options. Again, we cannot complain about not having any. Some scikit-learn estimators know how to train in chunks. They've been written to do so. And those that do implement the partial fit method. So in this case, Dask can help with the data management, shuffling the chunks around the cluster. And still, scikit-learn will do the actual training in chunks. Dask also comes with a smaller, but no, there are still there, a list of estimators that have been written to, to be distributed from the beginning, uh, such as you know, there are a number of clustering algorithms there. So you can use those as well. In this case, there is no scikit-learn in the picture. And the third option is to use an algorithm that already has support for distributed computation. This is the case with the ever-popular XGBoost. So in this case, Dask is not going to replace something that works very well, but rather it's going to help with the more tedious parts, like setting up the cluster, shipping the data to nodes, and so on. And fine, so far we talked about training a single model. But in order to train one, we need to set the hyperparameters, which is done ahead of time. And because in practice we cannot know which are the best parameters, we search for them. You can already do that in parallel on a single machine by passing the number of cores to grid and random search. The argument is much like scikit-learn, it's n jobs. And you can extend this to a cluster because Dask gives drop-in replacements for grid and random search with the same API. However, grid and random search are not the best. They are brute force algorithms, they are not smart. They don't use what has been learned so far during the search. So a better algorithm recently introduced in Dask and TensorFlow 2 is Hyperband. In this case, band comes from Bandit, which is a class of methods in machine learning, where actually, yes, we do use bandits. What Hyperband does is it starts many models in parallel. But what's different about this is that it monitors them as they train. And those that don't appear to make good progress are stopped early, before they even finish. So no time is wasted on them. 
and it does this repeatedly. So after a few iterations, fewer and fewer and fewer models are left in the search. And if you miss Bayesian search, which actually sometimes works better on a single machine, well, there's good news. There's a combination of Bayesian search and hyperband, which is called BOHB, and is available in a different package in AutoML under the hyperband on steroids class. And I included a, a screenshot from the paper, which contains many, many benchmarks. And indeed, I'm not sure if you can see from behind, but the speed up in some cases is 20, 20 times, which is impressive. Yes, and again, at the end, I will have the links to these papers as well. We can skip this. I mentioned earlier that Dask has very good monitoring capabilities. On the left, you see the profiler view, which is obtained automatically by taking snapshots of the call stack every 10 milliseconds. And on the right is the most important view of all, is the task stream. This is where you see what's happening in real time. This is what you don't have with low-key or multiprocessing. Each line corresponds to a core in the cluster and each color to a method. And there are two colors that you should, be wa you should watch for. White means a core is idle. You don't want to sit in the middle of the action because it means there's a bottleneck, it's waiting for something. And red means data shuffled over the network. It's perfectly OK to have a little bit, because now at some point you need to consolidate the results, but not too much, because that means latency, which kills performance. So as you use Dask, absolutely keep an eye on this view. And the more cores you have, the cooler it is. So that was Dask. The second framework I want to talk about today is H2O. It's written in Java. And it supports only distributed algorithms. Now, it was written expressly to do cluster computing for machine learning. So you have the algorithms that are supported on the right. It's kind of the usual suspect. It supports a number of languages, not only Python. So if you use R, that's for you. It, it has very good integration with Java as well. And it's written in Java. And if you're wondering why Excel is on, on the page, that means that you haven't worked in a bank. So just wait. Um, being written in Java, H2O can do multi-threading without the limitations that Python has. So it's more efficient in that sense. And one interesting capability it has is that it can export the model into standalone Java objects, which can be integrated into an enterprise application. And the reason this is relevant for today's talk is that by having the predictions done inside the application, you won't need to place a web service call to another cluster to get them, which means now you will get the predictions in microseconds or less. Any network call will be slower, or many times slower. Oh, sorry, this one. OK. So here's an example of how you can do a distributed gradient boosting on, with H2O. Uh, the code is pretty readable. As you can see, you're going to use the estimators in H2. And much like with Dask, you need to create a cluster or connect to a long-lived one. And the API is very, very similar in R as well. So again, if you use R, that's the solution for you. You get to hundreds of machines. So how do you choose between these two? Well, they, they have different strengths, really. So Dask is pure Python, so it might be preferable for teams that are only skilled in this language. H2O being written in Java will appeal more to teams that have a more composite, um, a, a, like a more diversified composition, like ours in TD. Also, Dask is better with the hyperparameter search, having implemented um, Hyperband, for instance. And it's, I think it's stronger on the data processing side. So it's often coupled with scikit-learn. You know, to have a mix of both data processing and machine learning. H2O is kind of at the other end. It's stronger on the machine learning part, so it's often coupled with Spark to do ETL. And the integration is done in a different project called Sparkling Water. There are, there are other parameters as well, so talk to me afterwards if you're actually curious. So I, I covered CPUs so far, but what about GPUs? Because everyone knows you know, they are faster. You should use GPUs with two conditions. First, 
you know, like in general, they are good for very complex, embarrassingly parallel computations. You know, GPUs have many, many thousands of cores, more every year. So it only makes sense to use them when your algorithm can actually process you know, that many calculations in parallel. This is the case with large neural networks. This is why they're so popular in deep learning. But not every algorithm is like that. The second case, the second condition, is that you know, a GPU processes data that resides in its internal memory. So you need to copy the data from the main memory of the computer to the GPUs. And this takes time, particularly over the PCI Express bus of a machine. Uh, for instance, NVIDIA has a different, faster bus as well called NVLink to address this. Okay. But this is good. So GPUs are good for deep learning, but deep learning is only one part of the entire machine learning landscape. So NVIDIA has recognized this. And what they want and what they started about a year ago is to work on a software stack that allows you to do not only training in the GPU, but everything that you actually need to do in practice. And that means loading the data from storage, cleaning the data, and then training and the prediction. This framework is called Rapids. It's open source, so you can take it from that API, from the URL. And what it gives is a parallel API, which is identical with Pandas and Scikit-learn, but this time running on GPUs. So the whole goal is to be able to switch a single import and switch from CPU to GPU. So I think this will be big, like once finished. I mean, it's very advanced. We can use it, and companies use it already today. The one remaining part is to have the loading from storage directly to the GPU. And we can see Dask again in the picture. This time, it's used to parallelize work across multiple GPUs on the same machine. And in a way, I think NVIDIA hired the best person in the world to help with this, because last year they hired Matthew Rocklin, who is the creator of Dusk. So now Dusk and Rapids are developed in sync, which is great for development, because it means now the APIs really mesh together very well. And on the right, you have the equivalent stacks that will be replacing Pandas and Scikit-learn, again, when GPU matters. What you also see is that Pandas is gone from the frame in terms of memory storage. Apache Arrow is a much more efficient memory format for the data. So here's a quick example how you do, how you use multiple GPUs in a cluster. I'm not going to go through the code. The whole point is that it's very readable. It's pure Python. There is no CUDA. There is no TensorFlow. There is no C++ involved. So you, the idea is to write with the same ease with which today you use Pandas and Scikit-learn. So to sum up, I think my personal recommendations would be first to properly use the computing power that we have today. So instead of jumping to use large clusters, start by properly using all the parallel computation power that we can get in a single machine first. And we can get very powerful machines. Remember that everything that you read about Hadoop was valid at the time it was designed, like almost you know, 20 years ago. So the world is very different today with, with computers with a lot of RAM, things that used to take an entire storage array. I, I think doing processing in the GPU will become a more and more important part of the high performance landscape, because again, the latency is much lower, and you can get speed ups of orders of magnitude compared to anything that you can do in a cluster. And if you do have to go in a cluster, then remember to pay proper attention to the engineering part. Distributed systems are not trivial. They require proper monitoring, so do put the time to create the infrastructure as well. And usually, the skills are different as well. Like, so you do need a team that's mixed in terms of DevOps, engineering, and data scientists as well. And finally, I think you, you need to balance the performance gains that you gain by using a particular technology with the amount of time and the technology risk that you put there as well. There's no point in saving one hour by using a technology that's not really understood by the team and then wasting four or five hours debugging it. And with this, these are the references that I mentioned in the presentation. 
I put the slides online as well, so you can take them from that URL, and you can contact me with questions afterwards. And I would like to thank you very much for your time and attention. Hi. Uh, so I work for a bank. So it's a recently launched uh, bank. Uh, so obviously, we don't have enough data. But uh, as we scale up, as we grow, we will have more data, right? And like the kind of problems that we want to solve, is like uh, you know, loan default rate kind of uh, problems. So I was wondering, like what you were saying earlier about you know using your single machine to the maximum before you go on to using GPUs. So I was wondering, like how and when do you decide like that you need to uh, scale up? Okay. So in terms of like the volume sorry. of data or uh, so the question is well it's it's imp if I understand correctly the question is when you decide to scale out versus up or because there's a bit of echo from the scene so yeah I'm, scale up okay yeah so, so how, when so, do you decide that you need more GPU resources or okay well so first it depends on your problem so again because GPUs only work when you have thousands of calculations in parallel right. not all the algorithms support that now, you can also experiment to see if they help. Like, if, for instance, if you can rent uh, an instance in the cloud. Um, if it's not neural networks, that only some algorithms will work on GPUs. Right. Like those that really try things in parallel as opposed to more iterative. For instance, random forests are more parallel than, say, XGBoost. Right. Some extent. OK. Yeah, like if if you need more details, let's talk afterwards. Yeah, okay. Because then then I I need, I need more context to understand. Okay. Sure, sure. The okay. problem. Okay.